share a few thoughts on this very familiar uh, chapter. Uh, we've, uh, many of us, I'm sure, are familiar with this chapter inside and out, and I don't think I can add anything to it. Uh, but I don't get tired of preaching. And, and I hope you don't get tired of listening. You may get tired of, well, you will get tired of listening to me, uh, but you should never get tired of listening to the Word of God. Amen. And uh, it can help you. It's an old, old story. Amen. Let's begin in verse 1. I'll read uh, down through uh, verse 14. 13 or 14, but just stay with me there and uh, try not to tune out. I know how that is when you start reading along and your mind starts wondering. And I pray the Lord to keep us, keep us focused and uh, help me preach. So, Exodus chapter 12, beginning verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor take next unto his house, take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out of the sh out of, uh, from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast it with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with his pertinence thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Amen. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Lord, I pray you'd help me this morning. Fill my mouth, Lord, with your words that you'd have me to say, Lord Father. God, give me unction, Lord Father. I just want you to preach me this morning, Lord Father. And, and I don't want to do anything, Lord Father, but what you'd have me to do, Lord Father. And I pray you put a hedge around us for the next little bit, Lord Father. And Holy Spirit, I pray you just move right here behind this pulpit, Lord Father, and me first, Lord Father. And then down through the aisles and the pews, Lord Father, touching hearts. Lord Father, convicting, Lord Father, and moving as only you can, Lord Father. And, and we need you. We confess that this morning, Lord Father, that we need you, Lord Father. And we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, chapter 12, again, is a very familiar chapter to us. In fact, the whole book of Exodus, uh, one of the most, if not the most familiar book, maybe in the Old Testament, it is a sequel to the book of Genesis. It starts with a conjunction. In fact, the first five books of the Bible are all connected with conjunctions, and, and now. And so this is one, one huge book, if you would, of the first five books. They're all connected together. They're a, a narrative, if you will, um, of this chapter 12. And Exodus... It's primarily a book about redemption. It's about redemption. It's about a people in bondage to the world. They're in captivity. And it's about God sending a deliverer to bring them out of that bondage. And so that's the theme uh, of this book. And Exodus is quoted throughout the New Testament. Moses is quoted 
Moses is mentioned throughout the New Testament. And there's so many things in the book of Exodus that are a parallel to God sending His Son Jesus, a Savior, to deliver you and I from the bondage of sin. Uh, it's, you just can't hardly miss it. When you read the New Testament, you'll see it over and over again that Jesus and all the writers of the New Testament will make mention and make reference to this. Let me read you just a few. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And that's talking about the Red Sea here in the book of Exodus. And all were baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. And so you'll notice some parallels here. There was a rock that was smitten uh, in the narrative of the Exodus. And that rock gave out living water to all that were around it. Yep. Uh, there was a, uh, an incident there, if you recall, where they complained and they were hungry and they said, give us food. And God sent manna from heaven. And all these things were a picture of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, you think Moses uh, gave you bread out the wilderness? And no, he didn't give you bread. My father... He Amen. says, the true bread, and I'm it. I'm That's the bread right. of life. Right. Hey. He says, you think that rock that was smitten gave water? Not really. I'm the one that gives water. Amen. Eternal water. The Holy Spirit of life. I'm the living water. And listen, and just all, all so many, so many of these references. John, uh, one of the most well-known chapters in the Bible, John uh, chapter 3, verse 14 says, it's, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so even uh, Jesus talking about some more of these parallels between what happened during this uh, redeeming period of the nation of Israel and the comparison uh, to God redeeming you and I. So this book was a shadow of something to come. Okay, So it's not just a historical event. It's not just history, but it's the shadow of our Lord and Savior redeeming His people, redeeming the church. And so many instances throughout the book of Exodus, but there's no more important similarity, illustration, type, shadow than right here in chapter 12. Amen. This is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, this is the Gospel. <laughs> if there ever was the Gospel, uh, this is it. Right here in the Old Testament. And there's so much we can talk about here uh, as we're taking the Lord's Supper, obviously, uh, the last week of the, the Lord's life, uh, the Passover week, uh, follows this chapter 12 right down to the letter. And we talked a little bit about that on Wednesday night, and we could go into so many things, but I just want to try to preach a few things here. Notice back again in this first Corinthians, and I'll read this. Uh, uh, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So the Passover that we read about in chapter 12, Paul's clear in 1 Corinthians that this Passover is a type, is an illustration of our Passover, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with all that said and all that background, let's go through this thing a little bit. And I hope this will bless you. We just don't... Uh, take it lightly that we're going to take communion today. We shouldn't take it lightly the Lord's Supper. Amen. He died for you uh, that you might be saved. He died for you not only that you might go to heaven, but right now you're saved. Right now you can live for God. Amen. Right now your sins are forgiven. And, and so it's something very serious and, and, and we need to treat it as such when we take the Lord's Supper. And, and so it's a good sermon uh, I think to prepare our hearts for it. You'll notice uh, in chapter 11, verse 4, uh, let me just read this before I get to uh, preaching on it. It says, And Moses said, Thus say the Lord, uh, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beast. Now this is the last plague that's going to hit uh, you remember some of the plays, the lies, the frogs, you turn the water uh, there into blood, the Nile into blood, all these things. And this is the last, this is the culmination of these plagues. This is the last plague. It's when God's going to come through and He's going to smite all the firstborn. And He's going to do it at midnight. 
saying this is not my sermon, but I thought about preaching this. There's a lot of midnights in the Bible. Yeah, and there's about 13 verses uh, dealing with midnight in the Bible. And, and this is the very first time midnight appears. And I'm telling you, midnight in the Bible, when you read it, uh, it's a time when, listen, one day is over with and a new day is about to begin. Amen. And I'm telling you, not only in this situation was it a new day, and not only was it a, 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 a new a, a new revelation of God to these people, but notice what it said there in those first verses. He said, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. In other words, he said, listen, I'm going to make all things new. In fact, it's going to be so new and so outstanding that I'm just going to wipe away the calendar. Amen. Now you can't do that. Now you may think it's Monday, but you're probably crazy. Okay? It's Sunday. And you can tell people it's Monday all day long, but it'll still be Sunday. But when God says that today's the first day of the year, He can do that. Right. Because He's God. He does exactly what He wants. Right. And I'm telling you, He said it's so, this is going to be so uh, revolutionary, so uh, magnificent, so supernatural, something you've never seen before. Listen, I'm putting all these 400 years of bondage behind you, and this is going to be not just a new day, but a new year and a new life. And I'm telling you, if you're here this morning, this is the first Sunday of the new year, and I didn't Listen, the old, we thank God for it. Uh, we, we remember it with blessings. Some of you had a hard year, and, I'm, and some of you have made some mistakes, but I'm telling you that it's over with, and God says we're moving on from here. Amen. And I'm, I'm thankful that God can put away the past and make Amen. all things new. He said, we're going to change the calendar for this deal. Now, this is going to be something special. We're just going to change all the months up. And he says at midnight is when this thing is going to happen. And I tell you, midnight's throughout the Bible. You see it first here. You see it in the book of Judges. I believe it's chapter 16. If you remember that, Samson. Everybody remember Samson? And the enemy had him locked in this city. And he was in this city. And he was, the Bible says, at the gates. And the gates were closed in. And he was surrounded by the enemy. And the Bible says about midnight. <coughs> about midnight. He took the gates up off that city and put them on the back of his shoulders. And he marched up a hill and put them up there and got victory over the enemy. And I'm telling you, there's one. And at midnight, listen, in your life, if you want to, he'll take the gates of hell and pull them up off the hinges and carry them up on a hill called Mount Calvary. And if you'll trust in that, he'll give you victory hey. over death, hell, and the grave. That's what happens at midnight. Hey. You remember when Ruth at midnight? Ruth was a, a Gentile, praise the Lord. She wasn't a Jewish uh, woman. She was a Gentile woman. And about midnight, she went to the threshing floor hey. of a man named Boaz. Hey. The Bible said he was known as he was going to be her kinsman redeemer. Hey. She had nothing. Uh, she came back and she was gleaning. All she could do was just glean from the fields whatever they left after they were uh, harvesting the grain. But about midnight, uh, she found herself at the feet of her kinsman redeemer. And the Bible says he threw his robe of righteousness around her Amen. about midnight and said, don't you worry about it, honey. Hey, you were just poor and a nobody, but you're under my robe of righteousness now, and I'm going to redeem you, and I'm going to, you know what he said? I'm going to make you my bride. Hey. How about that? Yeah. I don't think nobody's with me on that. <laughs> I'm telling you, he put his robe of righteousness around me when I got saved, and listen, he's the bridegroom, and I'm the bride, and listen, he's coming back for me, and he's built me a, a mansion in heaven. You can have a little shack if you want to in heaven, but I've got a mansion in heaven, and he, I'm just kicking up the gold dust. It's all, it's all as good as done as far as he's concerned. Amen. I like midnight in the Bible. Y'all probably more familiar with this one. We'll jump to the New Testament. Remember Paul and Silas? Yeah. Got down there in jail. And the Bible says about midnight they started singing songs and praising the Lord. And they got down. They had the shackles on them in the dungeon. They down there in them shackles. I can see them now getting on their knees. And they start praising and singing praises. And something starts shaking. Yeah. And the Lord comes up and He just opens up the prison doors. Hey. And I'm telling you, that's what He can do in your life. Hey. Uh, how about this one? I'll give you one more. Can I give you one more? Hey. There's 13 of them. I don't want to go through all of them. I'll go through one more. Remember in Acts, Paul's going to Rome. Him and Luke and his crowd, they were on a ship. 
and it hit the worst storm they'd ever known. The ship was falling apart, and the Bible says, listen, about the time they thought all was lost, the Bible says about midnight, somebody looked out and they saw a shore. And I'm telling you, every person on that ship made it to shore. And I'm telling you, when you trust in Jesus Christ, there's a distant shore out there. There's a Beulah land over there. You can, I'm going to cross the river one day. And this ship's been battered a little bit. And listen, it doesn't matter. But I may make it on broken pieces. But I'm floating on over. He's carrying me on over. And there's a distant shore I'm looking for. And I'm going to walk through that gate one day. And He's going to welcome me home. And I'm going to see His face. About midnight they saw a distant shore. I'm looking for a distant place. Hey. A city whose builder and maker is God. Amen. A lot of midnights in the Bible. Notice what it says in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. You know, listen, all this is going on while they're still in bondage. He said, listen, you're not going to get free on your own. Nope. And you're not going to do anything that can help you. You're still in bondage, but I'm telling you right now, I'm fixing to bring you out if you'll just trust in me. And I'm telling you this morning, listen, you can't fix yourself up. And there's no ten steps to the better you because there is no better you. Okay? And you're lost. And you're headed for hell without Jesus Christ. And listen, He'll save you right where you are. You can't clean up. You can't get... Listen, all this, i got to clean up. I, listen, the only way you can get right with God is through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. He'll take you right where you're at in Egypt and save you pull you out of there. Make a new month. Make a new thing. Notice what it says here. I'll make a few comments. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of stuff in here. Notice verse 4. The, I like this part about it. It says here, And if the household be too little for the land, let his neighbor take unto his house, take it according to the number of souls. In other words, the, the lamb here, he said, was too big for the house. <laughs> there was more lamb than could be took. And I'm telling you, there's enough of Jesus that you can't take enough of Him till there's not some left over. And He said, there's so much of this lamb in this house that you got, why don't you go and take it to your neighbor's house? Because there's plenty for you and there's plenty for your neighbor. And there's plenty for your next neighbor. And there's not going to be a single person that there's not enough land to go around. Amen. And I'm telling you this year in 2020, if you want more of the land, you can have more of the land. Yeah. Now I'm telling you, I'm saved. And I'm saved. For, I'm, listen, I, I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on Him. And I'm saved. But I'm telling you in 2020, I need more of Jesus. Amen. I need more of the land. And He's got all that I need and then some too. You can't ask for too much of Jesus. He's not too busy this morning to come down to your situation. If He can deliver two million people from the hand of Egyptians, you don't think He can deliver you from what you're going through right now? You don't think He can make something new in your life? And the lamb is more than enough. Notice what else about this lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. I like that. Amen. The lamb shall be without blemish. That's, that's, that's very interesting when you, when you think about that. I want to read you something. The New Testament alludes to this and adds a little something to it. Let me just say this too. And this is another sermon. But if you read this chapter 12, the lamb is never plural. Brother Mike is always saying <laughs> Every time he starts talking about a lamb in chapter 12, he says it's, uh, an a, it's a, a lamb or the lamb or your lamb. Now that's interesting because there's two million people over plus right now. But the lamb's always just one. Yep. Isn't that interesting? They never plural. So notice what he says here. It's out blemish. The New Testament adds some stuff to this. And the Lamb of God is Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about here. We all know that from the reference that John the Baptist made, right? What did he say when he saw Jesus? He said, Behold, the Lamb of God. There you go. And so, we're talking about Jesus here. And Peter added something to this. To this very chapter 12 we're talking about. First Peter 1.9 says this, But with the precious... Listen, he's talking about you redeemed. 
not with gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb. Okay, you with me on that? Without blemish and without spot. So the lamb, uh, he tells us without blemish. Peter reveals a little bit more through the power of the Holy Spirit. says not only could it not have a blemish, but it could not have a spot either. Okay? So that's very important. Now blemish. Here, here's what... This is important. A blemish is it's an impairment, okay? It's, it's a deformity. It's something that the lamb uh, brought with him when he came to be inspected. It was something he had perhaps when he was born, okay? It was a deformity. Uh, maybe one leg or something. It doesn't matter what it was. It had a blemish on it. Not only could it not have a blemish, it couldn't have a spot, okay? A spot is something that... A spot is a discoloration, a stain, something that he picked up along the way after he was born. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And what I'm telling you is everyone in here has blemishes and spots. Yep. Okay? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. There's two things there that you've done. Short of the glory of God. That's a blemish. You brought you were you were short of the glory of God as soon as you came into this world. Your father is Adam. Right. Yep. No, my father. No, your father's Adam. Trace it on back. You can go to Ancestry.com and it'll end up in Adam. Okay? I, I tried that, went a little ways, seen some things I didn't like, I just quit it. You know what I mean? Some, some hangings, some thieving going on. I said, I know enough, just go right back to Adam. Okay? That's where it that's where stopped. You got a sin nature. Because your father was a sinner. Yeah. Jesus' father is God. Amen. There's no Adam's blood runs through him. Amen. He doesn't come short of the glory of God uh, because he is God. Okay? Amen. All right. The spots are something you pick up along the way. Yeah. And it'll take, listen, every week, <laughs> Christians like Velcro and everything and all kinds of sin that sticks to them. Okay? You pick up a lot of stuff during the week, okay? You pick up a lot of sin. You've sinned, uh, you fall short of the glory of God. Those two things are for sure about you. Jesus is perfect. He <coughs> follows God. He came into this world with no blemishes, but He walked 33 and a half years and He picked up no sin. Amen. Okay? Amen. And uh, listen, uh, <laughs> this is amazing to me. The testimony uh, about Jesus, Matthew 27, 4, uh, this is Judas after he betrayed the Holy Son of God. He said, Sin, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. Yep. Judas said, This man was innocent. He was sinless. It's all on me. Now, this is a this is a testimony of Judas. What what about Pilate? John 18, 38, Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Amen. Okay. How about one more? This is the best testimony. How about this? Romans 3, 25, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness. God said He's good. Yeah. Amen. Uh, listen, when God saw him on the cross, he said, I, that's good. That's a sacrifice I can live with. I'll take that. He's the perfect son of God. Amen. So the testimony of all is that God, uh, in the form of his dear son, Jesus Christ, is without blemish and without spot. Okay? Amen. That quali that's the only thing that qualifies a lamb. Okay? And the lamb of God had to meet that. Nobody else meets that, okay? Some of you think you're pretty close, but you're not, okay? <laughs> Nobody meets that. Nobody meets that. So we have the Lamb and all His attributes, perfection. We have the Lamb and all His abundance. There's more Lamb than there are people that need to be saved, okay? And, but then there's the application of it. Uh, verse 7 in chapter 12 says, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And the blood shall be, this is verse 13, The blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Isn't that interesting that the blood 
You'll notice that the blood was on the sides and it was on the top. But it wasn't on the floor. Listen, God said, you're not going to trample underfoot the blood of this lamb. You can put it on the sides, you can put it on, but you're not going to walk through and trample underfoot the precious blood of this Lamb. And I'm telling you, as Christians, we ought to be weary. If we're saved in here this morning, we ought to be careful about how we treat the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We ought to be careful about how we treat His Son. Amen. Hebrews says this, verse 27 and 29 in chapter 10, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. And listen, here's why he put the blood on the, so the Bible. Listen, the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. And it answers the questions that arose in other parts of the Scripture you can find now here's, here, listen, here's the writer of Hebrews, Apostle Paul. Here's, here's he's going back and telling you why the blood wasn't put on the threshold. Threshold. Listen to what it says. And it counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. He said those folks aren't going to trample underfoot the blood. And that's an illustration from chapter 12 that I'm bringing to you and the house of God this morning, from chapter 12 all the way up to the New Testament, he said, do not trample underfoot the blood that saved you. Amen. And I'm telling you, we ought to be serious this year about what God's done for us through His precious Son and what we can do for Him. Who in here has done enough for God last year? Somebody. I saw somebody raise their hand over there. It's in the ushers over there. You have it. You had you had you had done all right. You had done what he deserved. He's done more for you than you've done for him. Amen. Amen. That's it. Amen. They took the hyssop. Leviticus 23, and if you read on through the Bible, they took hyssop, took him a basin of that precious blood. They took that hyssop and they struck the door with the hyssop. They put the blood on the door. The hyssop didn't save them. The bowl that the blood was in didn't save them. It had to be applied to the door. Yep. I'm telling you, just like that hyssop applies the blood, by faith you apply that to your heart and your soul. And when God sees the blood, He passes over you. you. They took that night and put the blood right there on the door. And John says that and Jesus said himself, he said, I am the door. Hey. That's pretty good, isn't it? There's all kinds of stuff in that chapter 12. You know what they did? They put that blood in. And they went inside on the other side of that door and they waited. They ate that land. Yep. They prayed. But you know what they had? They said, look, the blood's out there. And by faith, we believe that when God comes by, we're good to go because of the blood. And I'm telling you, when you put the blood of Christ on your soul, death is going to come by one day and He's going to put His cold hands on you and it will. I'm going to grab you. I've got you now just where I want you. But I'm going to tell you, there's one that looking up from heaven and says, hold up. Hey. I see the blood on Him. Hey. Yeah. And death's going to let go. And I'm telling you, this old body's going to go. But I'm going to live forever with Jesus. Amen. Because I put my faith in Him. And I'm telling you, the Passover is serious business because His body was broken for you. His blood was shed for you. And I'm telling you what, He expects. Listen, I'm not earning anything but what I'm doing, but with a great love and appreciation for what He's done for me. Amen. I think I owe Him a little something. Amen. I feel obligated. I feel like that's my reasonable service that I present my body a living sacrifice. How about that? Amen. What's wrong with that? Listen, you can't do too much for Him. You can't wear yourself out for Him uh, enough uh, for what He's done for you and I. And I'm telling you, uh, we ought to not take the blood of this covenant and trample it under our feet, but we ought to serve Him 
and loving us for what He's done for us. Amen. And I'm telling you, I don't know what went on last year, but this is a new year. Praise Amen. the Lord. Right. Let me close with this before we go into the Lord's Supper. Verse 14, I didn't read this. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it to the, a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. He said, I want you to remember. Does this sound familiar to do? He said, I want you to do this every year in remembrance of me. Yeah, yeah. That sound familiar to you? That's, that's this verse. That's, what, that's, what, that's, that's the communion we're about to take. That is the, listen, you call it the last Passover, but that night before Jesus was crucified, it went from the last Passover to the first Lord's Supper. Because the Lamb had done its job. Amen. And I'll tell you, He said, you ought not ever, you ought not ever, ever forget what I've done for you this night. Right. And I'm telling you, if you're saved in here, you ought never forget Amen. what God's done for you. You know, Amen. you know, <coughs> It's been a blessing for my life. It's not because of me. But I've never forgotten what it's like to be lost. I just haven't forgot. I haven't forgot how bad. Listen, I don't dwell on it. I, I try not to think about the things I've done. I, I, a lot of things. That, hey, who wouldn't like to go back and do some things over? Guess what? You can't do it. But I'm telling you, I haven't forgotten what He's forgiven. And I'm not going to forget what He's forgiven. And going forward, I don't want to ever forget what it was like to be the listen, to be out there lost and undone in my sins. And he came along and he ran to me. And he reached down Father, and I could run from him. And he saved me. And listen, we ought to, as a church and as people this morning, we ought to never forget what he's done for us. Amen. A lot of praise and thank you. We got something to shout about. Amen. And, and, I, and, and we ought to be shouting about. It. Praise his holy name. And to get us a little something here, what we got going on. There is a fountain, number 175. Before we go to the Lord's Supper, we're just going to have a little time off the call here. Now listen, let's all stand as we sing a verse or two. Most everybody in here. Number 175. Most everybody in here is... You, you've heard something like this before, Bob. You've heard a message like this before. And I, listen, here, here, you know the deal. I, I preach God's Word. He takes His Word. I don't do anything with it. I can't do nothing to get in the way of it. By the Holy Spirit of God, He takes His Word and starts applying it to your heart and to my heart. He starts convicting, reproving, encouraging, whatever that case may be. And I, I just can't understand uh, why, God, why people won't just let God have, the, have His way this morning. And then I go back to that time when God used to deal with me. And I say, well, I can't understand. Boy, I had a hard heart. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not dealing with God. I, I, I've heard all that before, but I, I'm, you know, I got time and I'm me. And, you know, I, I, I do what I want to do. No, you don't do what you want to do. Only one person does what he pleases, and that's God. And I'm just telling you, don't let your heart be so hard that another altar call goes by. Another opportunity for commitment this year goes by. God dealing with you, and you just get hard and say, you know what, I, I, I just, you know, I'll do something good this week and make myself feel better. Right? <laughs> Friend, I want to tell you something. If God's dealing with you, you just need to obey Him. Don't worry about the person beside you. He probably needs to come on you to. As we sing this, if you just want to come and thank God, say, God, I'm glad I, I don't want to ever forget what you did for me. Uh, it made something new in my life. And you made me new in my life. Or maybe you're just lost in here and you, you, you said, you know what, I, I just I know I need to come, but I just had never done it. But this can be your midnight. And start with something new in your life, new and different. Let's sing a few verses. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. That's in your heart. You're just being in the soul. There's much beneath that blood moves all their guilty stains. All their guilty sins. 
Praise the Lord. I'm looking for something new. Seeing it in a bundle is better than he's ever done before. He can do that. Praise his holy name. Y'all go ahead and be seated, please. I'm going to 